The rain had been relentless for hours. Each drop felt like it pierced the forest's thick canopy, creating a symphony of whispers among the trees. The five campers, Tom, Lisa, Jake, Sarah, and Matt, huddled close as they trekked deeper into the woods, their flashlights flickering in and out of life. They hadn't planned on this. What was supposed to be a casual weekend camping trip had turned into something far more sinister when they realized they were hopelessly lost. We're not gonna make it out tonight, Jake muttered, squinting through the downpour. There's something ahead, Sarah whispered, her voice trembling as she pointed into the gloom. Through the sheet of rain, the outline of an old cabin emerged, almost as if the woods themselves had revealed it at the perfect moment. It stood crooked and forgotten, half devoured by the wilderness around it. It's better than staying out here, Tom said, his breath fogging in the cold air. They approached cautiously, the sound of creaking wood underfoot matching their hurried heartbeats. The cabin door hung slightly ajar, its rusty hinges groaning as Tom pushed it open. Inside, the air was thick with the stench of mold and rot. Cobwebs blanketed the corners of the room, and a fireplace long extinguished lay cold in the center. Jake nudged Lisa. What do you think? Haunted? Don't even joke about that, she whispered back, her eyes wide as she scanned the shadows. As they settled in, the night closed in around them. The only light came from the dim flicker of a half-burned candle they found in the corner, casting long, ghostly shadows on the peeling walls. Then from the silence came a noise, a soft thud from above. Did anyone else hear that? Lisa asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Probably just the wind, Matt said, though the uncertainty in his voice was obvious. The sound came again, louder this time, like something or someone moving across the attic floor. Tom looked toward the ceiling. We should check it out. Are you insane? Sarah hissed, grabbing his arm. Just leave it alone. But curiosity got the best of him. Tom grabbed the candle and slowly climbed the stairs, each step creaking louder than the last. The others followed hesitantly behind, their eyes fixed on the ceiling above them. The attic door was closed, but as they approached, it swung open on its own with an eerie creak. Tom entered first, holding the candle high. The small attic was empty, save for an old, dust-covered chest in the corner. What the hell? Jake murmured. Who keeps a chest in a place like this? Tom knelt down and pried it open. Inside was an old, leather-bound journal. Its pages yellowed with age, the ink faded and smudged. He flipped it open, revealing the messy scrawl of someone clearly in distress. This looks... recent, Sarah noted, running her finger across the ink, like it hasn't been here that long. Tom read aloud from the journal. It's watching me. Every night it comes closer. I hear it, feel it. I don't know how long I can survive. The wind howled outside, rattling the cabin's walls. As Tom continued reading, the entries became more frantic. They're gone, one by one. No one believes me. It takes them when they sleep. Lisa gasped as the final entry sent a chill down their spines. If you're reading this, it's already too late. Leave now. It's coming for you next, suddenly felt colder, and the walls seemed to close in around them. Before anyone could react, a deafening crash sounded from below. Matt, who had been closest to the stairs, went down to check. Guys, his voice trembled. The front door, it's gone. What do you mean gone? Tom asked, rushing to Matt's side. The front door, which they had closed behind them, was no longer there. It wasn't just open, it was as if it had never existed replaced by an unbroken wall of wooden planks. Panic washed over them as they realized the windows, too, were now sealed shut. We're trapped, Sarah whispered, her voice shaking with fear. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps echoed from the attic again, heavier this time. All five campers turned in horror toward the attic door, which now swung slowly open, revealing nothing but a yawning black void. I don't think we're alone, Jake muttered. A chill ran down Lisa's spine as a voice, barely audible but distinctly inhuman, whispered from the darkness above, You're next. For a moment, no one moved. The only sound was the pounding of their hearts, drowning out the constant rain outside. The attic, once just an empty space filled with dust, now felt alive, watching them from its dark corners. Jake was the first to snap out of it. We need to get out of here, he muttered, backing toward the stairs. We'll find another way. No, Lisa cut him off, her voice shaky but firm. Something is in here with us. Didn't you hear that? Her eyes darted back and forth as though expecting the voice to return. We're not safe anywhere, Sarah whispered, hugging herself, as if that could keep the looming dread away. 
Tom's jaw tightened as he weighed their options. He looked at the walls, still solid where the door and windows once were. We should check outside, he suggested. Maybe there's another exit, a cellar or something. Jake shook his head. What if there's no way out? We're stuck. Not yet, Tom replied, forcing a calm he didn't feel. The group descended the creaking staircase, huddling closer as the shadows seemed to grow longer around them. The storm outside had intensified, rattling the cabin with gusts of wind that sounded almost like whispers. The ground floor was worse than before. The air felt heavier, thick with something unseen yet oppressive. Jake took the lead, flashlight in hand, sweeping the beam across the room. The walls and floor groaned under their weight, as though the cabin itself were breathing with them. Suddenly, a sharp sound cut through the silence, like a nail being dragged across wood. It echoed from the far corner where the shadows seemed the deepest. Did you hear that? Sarah whispered, her voice barely audible over the howling wind outside. Yeah. Jake's voice was tense. His flashlight flickered as he aimed it toward the source. In the corner of the room, barely visible, was another door. This one was unlike the others. It looked newer, more polished, as though someone had replaced it recently. I don't remember seeing that door earlier, Matt said, moving closer. Neither do I, Tom added, swallowing hard. They stared at it in silence. The door didn't belong, and they all knew it. Yet the pull was undeniable. Jake stepped forward, gripping the handle. It was cold to the touch, almost freezing. With a shaky breath, he turned the knob. The door creaked open to reveal a staircase leading down into the blackness of a basement they hadn't known existed. This is a bad idea, Sarah muttered, gripping Tom's arm. We shouldn't go down there. We don't have much of a choice, Tom replied. His eyes, though calm, betrayed a growing sense of dread. The five of them descended the stairs, their footsteps echoing hollowly. The deeper they went, the colder it became. The air was damp and the smell of rot grew stronger. The basement wasn't much different from the rest of the cabin, decaying and forgotten. But in the middle of the room stood a large wooden table, and on it a pile of objects covered by a dirty sheet. Tom slowly approached the table, pulling the sheet back to reveal a collection of strange, twisted trinkets. A small knife with a broken handle, a cracked mirror, a child's doll missing its eyes, and in the center of it all, a large leather-bound book. The journal. No. No way. Jake whispered. We left that upstairs. It's the same one, Lisa added, her voice trembling. Tom opened it again, flipping to the last page they had read. The words were still there. If you're reading this, it's already too late. Leave now, it's coming for you next. But below that, new words had appeared, written in the same frantic scrawl. It has begun. A loud crash reverberated from above. Something or someone was upstairs. Did anyone else hear that? Lisa asked, clutching Jake's arm tightly. Before anyone could answer, the lights flickered, casting the room in eerie, intermittent flashes of brightness. In one of the brief flashes, Tom saw it, just for a second. A figure in the corner, watching them. It was gone in the next blink. We're not alone down here, Tom whispered, his voice shaking. Suddenly, Matt screamed. They turned to see him staring at his hands, his fingers clawing at his throat as though something invisible was choking him. His eyes bulged in terror. Matt? What's happening? Sarah shrieked, rushing toward him, but as soon as she reached out, his body was yanked back into the shadows with an impossible force. Matt! Jake screamed, chasing after him, but the darkness swallowed him whole. There was nothing. No sound. No trace. Where did he go? Sarah cried, her voice cracking with panic. I don't know. He was right here! Jake shouted, his voice breaking as the reality of what had just happened set in. Something's hunting us. Tom whispered, fear finally breaking through his calm exterior. Lisa sobbed quietly. We're going to die here, just like the people in the journal. Tom's eyes fell on the journal again. He opened it to the last page, his hands trembling. There was now a new entry, written in that same frantic hand. One down. The air in the basement felt heavier. Something in the shadows shifted, and they knew. Whatever had taken Matt was still down there with them. They had no choice but to go back upstairs. As they raced up the steps, their breathing heavy and uneven, the sound of Matt's scream still echoed in their ears. The moment they reached the top, the door to the basement slammed shut behind them with a force that shook the cabin. They were down to four, and the journal was far from finished. The door slamming behind them felt like a final judgment. There was no turning back. 
The basement now held Matt, and the rest of them were next in line. Each second stretched on, the cabin seeming to breathe with the same slow dread that crept through their veins. Lisa was the first to break the silence, her voice trembling. We have to get out of here. We need to. There's nowhere to go, Jake snapped, his eyes wide with panic. The door's gone, the windows are sealed, and something, his voice cracked, something took Matt. Tom stood silent, gripping the journal tighter. Every entry he read felt like a noose tightening around their throats. We can't panic, he said, though his voice was far from steady. There has to be a way out. We just need to keep our heads. Keep our heads? Sarah hissed. Matt's gone. We're trapped in this cursed place, and you're acting like we can just walk out of here. There's no way it wants us to get out, Lisa whispered, barely holding back tears. That's why it sealed the cabin. It's playing with us. Tom's eyes darkened as he turned back to the journal. Each time he opened it, something new was written. He flipped through the pages, almost afraid of what he might find next. Suddenly he stopped. There's a new entry. They all froze. The flickering candlelight danced across the pages as Tom read aloud. The second one will be soon. Don't look away from the shadows. It likes when you don't notice. Jake's flashlight sputtered again, plunging them into near darkness before it flickered back to life. He swung it wildly around the room, the beam bouncing off the cracked walls. Did you hear that? Sarah asked suddenly, her voice barely above a whisper. They all fell silent, listening. At first, there was nothing, just the wind howling through the cracks in the cabin. But then, slowly, they heard it. A faint, dragging sound, like something heavy being pulled across the wooden floor. It was coming from upstairs. No, Lisa whispered, backing away. No, 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 I'm not going up there. We don't have a choice, Tom said, his voice grim. Whatever this thing is, it's not going to stop. The dragging sound continued, louder now, accompanied by the occasional creak of floorboards above their heads. Each noise felt closer, as if whatever was upstairs was making its way toward them. Tom, Sarah's voice wavered as she pointed toward the ceiling. They all looked up. The shadows above them were wrong, thicker, darker, moving like smoke but solid, as if they were being watched by something beyond the blackness. Suddenly, the sound stopped. Silence, thick and unnatural, filled the room. Jake swung his flashlight back toward the staircase leading upstairs, but the light only seemed to push the darkness back an inch before being swallowed whole. Tom clenched the journal tighter, flipping through the pages frantically. There has to be something, some way to stop this thing. Sarah backed into the corner, her eyes locked on the ceiling. It's here, she whispered. I can feel it. It's watching us. We need to stay together, Tom said, but his voice sounded hollow, even to himself. If we stick together, maybe? Before he could finish, the darkness above shifted again, and this time it moved fast. Too fast. Jake screamed as something unseen yanked him off his feet. His flashlight flew from his hand, clattering to the floor as he was dragged toward the stairs. Jake, Tom yelled, lunging forward, but it was too late. Um, in the blink of an eye, Jake's body was pulled into the blackness, his scream echoing down the hall before being cut off abruptly. The darkness swallowed him whole. Lisa collapsed to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. Oh my God, it took him, it took him, too. Sarah stood frozen, her eyes wide with terror as she whispered, We're next. We're all next. Tom picked up Jake's discarded flashlight, his hands shaking. He aimed the beam toward the staircase, but there was nothing. No trace of Jake. No movement. Just silence. The journal lay open on the floor, its pages fluttering slightly in the draft. A new line of text had appeared. Two down. Tom's hands trembled as he read the words aloud. It's marking us. The remaining three huddled together, their backs against the cold wall of the cabin. The air felt thicker now, the room smaller, as though the cabin itself was slowly closing in on them. The shadows flickered and twisted, moving closer. What do we do? Lisa whimpered. We're all going to die in here. We can't give up, Tom said, though he barely believed his own words. There has to be something, some way to stop it. But as he spoke, the shadows began to move again. This time... They came from every corner of the room, creeping closer, inch by inch, until the darkness seemed to envelop them. Then, out of the silence, came a voice. Not the faint whisper they'd heard before, but a deep, guttural sound that seemed to come from the very walls of the cabin itself. You're next. The words hung in the air like a death sentence. Tom's flashlight flickered again, and in the brief moment of light, he saw it. A figure, 
tall, twisted, with hollow, glowing eyes, standing at the edge of the darkness, watching them. But then the light went out, and the scream that followed wasn't his. It was Sarah's. Tom and Lisa spun around just in time to see Sarah's body being dragged, like the others, into the shadows. Her scream echoed for a moment before being silenced. The darkness consumed her. And then there were two. The journal lay open at their feet, the next line already written, three down. Lisa sobbed uncontrollably, falling to her knees. It's coming for us. It's coming. Tom stared at the journal, his mind racing. He had to figure it out. There had to be something, some clue, some way to stop this madness. But no matter how hard he thought, there was nothing. The cabin was alive with malice, and it had one goal, to finish its story. Tom and Lisa stood frozen in the oppressive darkness, their minds reeling from the loss of their friends. The cabin had turned into a twisted, living nightmare, and it was clear, whatever force was hunting them, it wasn't stopping until every last one of them was gone. Lisa sat on the floor, her body trembling uncontrollably. We're going to die, she whispered, staring blankly at the floor. We're going to die just like the others. Don't say that, Tom said, though his voice lacked conviction. He was just as terrified, but he couldn't let himself break down. Not yet. He picked up the flashlight and aimed it at the journal lying open on the floor. Every time something new happened, the journal had foretold it. If it was the key to their doom, maybe it held the key to their survival. The page had already written its next entry. The last one is already here. Tom's stomach sank. He glanced at Lisa, her face pale with fear. We're still here, he muttered, which means it's not over yet. We need to find a way out, Lisa whispered. She wiped her tear-streaked face and tried to steady her breathing. There has to be something. Tom nodded, though he knew the odds were slim. The cabin was sealed off from the outside world. There were no windows, no doors, only the suffocating walls that seemed to close in around them. But they couldn't just sit and wait to be taken like the others. We need to search the cabin, Tom said. There might be something we missed. A hidden passage, a trapdoor, anything. Lisa's eyes flickered with a faint glimmer of hope. It was desperate, but it was better than doing nothing. They moved through the cabin cautiously, keeping close to each other as the flashlight beam swept across the decaying walls. The cabin groaned and creaked as if it were mocking their efforts. The flickering shadows in every corner seemed to watch them, waiting for the moment they let their guard down. As they reached the far side of the room, Lisa paused, her breath catching in her throat. Tom, she whispered, pointing at the floor. There, half hidden beneath the tattered remains of an old rug, was a wooden hatch. Tom's heart skipped a beat. He hurried over and yanked the rug aside, revealing the outline of a trapdoor. The wood was old and rotting, but the handle was intact. Do you think it leads outside? Lisa asked, her voice tinged with hope. Tom didn't answer right away. He knelt beside the hatch, gripping the handle. It felt cold beneath his fingers, like it hadn't been touched in decades. It's the only chance we've got, he said quietly. He pulled the hatch open. The hinges screeched loudly, as if protesting, and the air that rose from below was thick and stale, carrying the unmistakable scent of decay. A set of stone steps led down into complete darkness. Tom aimed the flashlight down into the abyss. The beam barely cut through the thick gloom, revealing nothing but the steps descending into the unknown. We should go, Lisa said, her voice shaking. It's got to be better than staying up here. Tom hesitated. Everything about the hatch screamed danger, but there was no turning back now. Let's go, he said, offering his hand to Lisa. They descended slowly, the old steps groaning under their weight. The deeper they went, the colder it became. The walls were damp, covered in moss and grime, and the air felt thicker, almost suffocating. At the bottom of the stairs, the flashlight flickered once, then twice, before it went out completely. No, Lisa gasped, her voice rising in panic. Not now. Please, not now. Tom smacked the flashlight, trying desperately to get it to work, but it remained dark. His heart raced as he fumbled through his backpack, searching for another light source. He found a small emergency lighter and flicked it on. The weak flame cast flickering shadows across the stone walls. It wasn't much, but it would have to do. What is this place? Lisa whispered, her voice trembling as she looked around. The space they had descended into wasn't a cellar. It was a crypt. Old stone slabs lined the walls, each one covered in dust and cobwebs. The ceiling dripped with moisture, and the air felt oppressive like they were being buried alive. 
Tom's lighter flickered in his hand, threatening to go out at any moment. It's not safe here, he muttered. We need to keep moving. But as they took a step forward, the walls began to shake. A deep, rumbling noise filled the crypt, and the ground beneath them trembled. Tom and Lisa froze as they realized the source of the sound. It was coming from below them. Suddenly, the stone slabs along the walls began to crack and shift. Slowly, impossibly, the slabs slid open, revealing what lay inside, skeletal remains, ancient and decayed, wrapped in tattered burial shrouds. Lisa let out a choked sob, backing away from the horrific sight. What is this? What's happening? Tom's heart pounded in his chest as the bones within the crypt began to stir. The ancient corpses slowly rose from their resting places, their hollow eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. The crypt was coming alive. We have to get out of here, Lisa screamed, grabbing Tom's arm. They ran back toward the staircase, but the ground beneath them cracked and shifted, blocking their path. The way out was gone, sealed by the very stones that had once held the dead. Lisa's voice broke with fear. Tom, were trapped. Tom's mind raced, searching for something, anything that could save them. The journal. He had left it upstairs, but it was their only connection to whatever force was controlling this nightmare. If only he had kept it with him. But then, the lighter flickered out, plunging them into total darkness. Lisa's scream pierced the air as the skeletal figures moved closer, their bones rattling with each step. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the rumbling stopped. The crypt fell silent, save for the sound of Tom and Lisa's ragged breathing. The skeletal figures stood motionless, their glowing eyes fixed on the two of them. Tom reached out, grabbing Lisa's hand. Stay close, he whispered, his voice shaking. We'll find a way. But as they turned to move, something cold brushed against Tom's arm. He gasped, yanking his hand back, but it was too late. The icy grip tightened, pulling him toward the dark. Lisa screamed, but her voice was drowned out by a sudden, deafening roar. Tom struggled, but the force dragging him was too strong. He felt himself being pulled deeper into the crypt, the cold enveloping him as he slipped away into the shadows. And then, nothing. Silence. Lisa stood frozen, her body shaking with terror. She was alone. The journal's final entry had been written. Four down. Lisa stood in the pitch-black crypt, her breath coming in shallow, ragged gasps. The silence around her was deafening. Tom was gone, just like the others. She was the last one left. Her mind raced, struggling to comprehend the horror of what had happened. The journal, the cabin, the crypt. It all felt like a twisted game, and she was its final pawn. Her heart pounded in her chest, fear coursing through her veins. There was no escape, no hope, only the suffocating darkness and the unseen force that had already claimed her friends. But she couldn't let it win. She refused to die here. Not like this. Lisa took a shaky step forward, her hands outstretched in front of her groping through the darkness. Her fingers brushed against the cold, damp stone walls of the crypt. Her breath caught in her throat as she tried to steady herself, forcing her mind to focus. Think, Lisa, she whispered to herself. There has to be a way out. There has to be. Suddenly, a faint light appeared ahead, a soft, flickering glow that seemed to beckon her. It was barely more than a pinprick in the darkness, but it was something. Clinging to this faint hope, Lisa moved toward it, her footsteps hesitant and unsteady on the uneven stone floor. As she approached, the light grew brighter, revealing a door at the far end of the crypt. The door was old, its wood cracked and splintered with age, but the soft light seeped from the edges, casting eerie shadows on the floor. Lisa hesitated, her instincts screaming at her not to trust it. But what choice did she have? There was no going back, not that there was anywhere to go. Taking a deep breath, she pushed the door open. The door creaked loudly as it swung inward, revealing a small room lit by a single candle. The flickering light danced across the stone walls, casting long, wavering shadows. And there, in the center of the room, was the journal. It sat on a wooden pedestal, open, waiting. Lisa's blood ran cold. The journal had been left upstairs. How was it here? And who, or what, had placed it there? Slowly, cautiously, she stepped into the room. The candle's flame flickered as she approached the journal, the air thick with an unnatural chill. Her heart pounded in her chest as she stared down at the pages. A new entry had appeared, written in the same frantic scrawl as before. Only one remains. Lisa swallowed hard, her hands trembling as she turned the page. The next entry sent a chill down her spine. The final chapter begins now. 
Before she could process the words, the candle suddenly snuffed out, plunging the room into darkness. Lisa froze, her breath catching in her throat. She could feel it. Something in the room with her, watching, waiting. Her heart raced as she fumbled in the dark, trying to back away from the journal, but her feet felt heavy, rooted to the floor. The air around her grew colder, the oppressive weight of the unseen force pressing down on her. Then she heard it, a voice, soft, whispering in her ear. Lisa. Her blood turned to ice. The voice was familiar, too familiar. It sounded like Jake, but it couldn't be. Jake was gone. She spun around, eyes wide, but there was nothing, just the darkness. The voice came again, closer this time. Lisa, it's time. No, she whimpered, backing into the pedestal. You're not real. You're not. Before she could finish, a cold hand grasped her shoulder. She screamed, spinning away, but there was no one there. The journal lay open on the pedestal, the pages turning on their own, the ink flowing like blood onto the parchment. The voice whispered once more, but this time it was different. It wasn't Jake. It wasn't any of her friends. It was something far darker, far older. The story must end, Lisa. Her heart pounded in her chest as the words echoed in her mind. The journal was writing itself, the final page filling with ink. She could barely make out the words, but they were clear enough. Five down. No, Lisa screamed, backing away from the journal, her voice echoing off the stone walls. I'm not going to die here. I'm not part of your story. But as she screamed, the journal's pages flipped to the very beginning, the first entry written so long ago. It detailed a group of five campers who had stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin deep in the woods. The campers had taken refuge for the night, only to be hunted down one by one by an unseen force. The story mirrored theirs exactly, each step leading to the same inevitable conclusion. And then Lisa saw it. The final twist. Her name had been there from the start. The journal hadn't just been a record of what had happened. It had been writing their story all along, manipulating every moment, every choice they made. The campers weren't just victims. They were characters, part of an ancient, cursed narrative. And now, Lisa was the last chapter. Tears streamed down her face as she fell to her knees, the weight of the truth crashing down on her. She had never had a chance. None of them had. The journal's final page filled itself in, the ink flowing like blood. The end. Lisa's breath caught in her throat. She felt the cold grip of something unseen wrapping around her, pulling her down deeper into the darkness. She struggled, but it was futile. The cabin, the crypt, the journal, it was all part of the same twisted force, a force that had been feeding off their fear, their pain, their deaths. And now it had her. Her final scream echoed through the crypt as the darkness closed in, swallowing her whole. The journal lay still on the pedestal, its pages now blank. The candle flickered back to life, casting its soft, flickering glow across the empty room. There was no trace of Lisa, no trace of any of them. Only the journal remained, waiting. Story number two. The woods were unnaturally quiet, as though the very trees were holding their breath. The crackling campfire, once roaring with life, now smoldered weakly in the center of the small clearing. Five friends huddled around it, their faces barely visible in the dim light. An occasional spark jumped from the fire, but it was dying, and with it, the comforting warmth. Looks like it's giving up, Rachel said, hugging her knees. The wind whispered through the trees, brushing through her hair like fingers. We should get some more wood before it goes out completely. Nah, grinned Mason, the self-proclaimed tough guy of the group. This is fine. Gives it more of a spooky vibe, don't you think? Dan, the youngest of the group, shivered. Maybe we should call it a night. It's late, and I'm starting to feel like we're being watched. Watched? Kelly scoffed. By what? There's nothing out here but us and some squirrels. Squirrels don't stare at you from the shadows, Dan muttered, eyes darting to the edge of the clearing where the trees seemed to stretch closer in the encroaching darkness. Mason laughed, tossing another twig into the fire. Oh, oh. Come on, Dan. Don't be a wuss. Besides, he leaned forward, his voice dropping low, if anything, you should be more worried about what's in the fire. He pointed to the center of the dwindling flame, where only a single ember remained glowing faintly. Rachel raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? Legend says, Mason began in a mock, serious tone, that when a fire dies down to a single ember like that, it's not just a piece of burning wood. It's the heart of a demon, waiting for the right moment to come back to life. A collective groan rose from the group, but Mason's grin didn't waver. He was always the one to try to spook them out during these camping trips. Still, 
The air around them felt heavier with each word he spoke, and Rachel's gaze lingered on the ember a moment longer than she would have liked. Dan shifted nervously. That's not funny, man. It's just a story, Mason said, rolling his eyes. Besides, look at it. It's practically dead. Just then, a cold gust of wind swept through the clearing, blowing out the remnants of the fire. All that was left was that single ember, brighter now, pulsing like a heartbeat. No one moved. Whoa, what the hell? Kelly whispered, her voice barely audible. The ember flared. It was no longer orange, but a deep, unnatural red. It expanded, stretching and twisting like a living thing. The forest, which had been silent all night, seemed to breathe, the wind picking up, whistling through the trees with an eerie howl. Rachel scrambled back from the fire pit. Mason, what did you do? I didn't do anything. Mason's bravado had crumbled, his eyes wide as he stared at the glowing ember. It pulsed again, growing in size, and from within the light, something began to take shape. A shadowy figure rising from the center of the pit. Kelly screamed as the figure solidified. A dark, towering form, its eyes burning with the same crimson light as the ember. Its presence sucked the warmth from the air, leaving the clearing frozen in terror. Before anyone could react, the shadow surged forward, engulfing Mason in an instant. He let out a blood-curdling scream as his body was dragged into the fire, vanishing within the embers as though swallowed by the darkness itself. The others scrambled to their feet, horror etched on their faces. Mason, Rachel screamed, but there was no trace of him, only the ember, now burning brighter than ever. We, we need to get out of here, Dan stammered, backing away, his face pale. Kelly grabbed his arm, pulling him along as they stumbled toward the edge of the clearing. Rachel followed close behind, her heart pounding in her chest. But no matter how fast they ran, it felt like the trees were closing in on them, their branches twisting and contorting, blocking their path. Dan tripped, falling hard to the ground. Before Kelly or Rachel could reach him, the shadow returned, emerging from the ember with unnatural speed. It wrapped itself around Dan like a serpent, and with a final terrified scream he was dragged, clawing at the dirt, into the fire. No! Kelly screamed, her voice breaking as she reached for him, but he was gone. There was no fire left, just the ember, pulsating, waiting. Rachel felt cold fingers brush her arm. She whirled around, expecting to see the shadow, but there was nothing. Yet, the feeling persisted. A presence, something watching them, stalking them from the darkness. We have to keep moving, Rachel whispered urgently, tears streaming down her face. It's coming for us. The ember flickered again, casting long shadows over the clearing. With each pulse, the dark presence seemed to grow stronger, closer, hungrier. Kelly, her breathing ragged, looked toward Rachel. What? What is it? What does it want? Rachel's gaze fell to the ember, still glowing malevolently. It wants us. And with that, the ember flared one last time, swallowing the remaining light of the clearing. Rachel and Kelly ran. They didn't stop to think, didn't look back. Their feet pounded the earth, kicking up dirt and leaves as they tore through the thickening woods. The night felt alive, the shadows stretching toward them like fingers trying to pull them back to the campfire. But there was no fire anymore. Only that single, malevolent ember burning and waiting. What the hell is that thing? Kelly shouted, her voice raw with fear as she stumbled through the underbrush. Rachel could barely breathe, her throat tight with panic. I... I don't know. Just keep going. Every step felt like a battle against the darkness itself as if the very forest was trying to devour them. Kelly glanced over her shoulder, eyes wide. I don't see it anymore, do you? Rachel didn't answer, too focused on pushing through the branches that clawed at her skin, but Kelly's words gnawed at her. The shadow, the thing that had taken Mason and Dan, wasn't chasing them. Not anymore. Suddenly, Kelly tripped on a root, tumbling hard to the ground with a yelp. Rachel skidded to a stop and rushed to her side, pulling her back to her feet. We can't stop, get up. But Kelly wasn't looking at Rachel. Her eyes were fixed ahead, wide with disbelief. Where? Where did the trail go? Rachel froze and followed Kelly's gaze. The narrow dirt path they'd been following had disappeared. In its place, nothing but dense forest stretching endlessly in every direction. No, no, this isn't possible. Rachel spun around, searching for any familiar landmark, but everything looked the same. The trees, the bushes, the suffocating dark. It was like the woods had swallowed the trail whole. We didn't stray that far, Kelly said, her voice trembling. We couldn't have. How can we be lost already? 
The wind rustled through the trees, and for a moment, Rachel swore she heard a low whisper, like a voice carried on the breeze. But the words were unintelligible, distant, and haunting. The air was thick with an unnatural chill, and Rachel's skin prickled with the sense that they were not alone. We have to keep moving, Rachel said, though her voice shook. If we stay here, it'll find us. Kelly nodded, though she looked pale, her eyes darting nervously around them. They began walking again, slower now, more deliberate, but with no idea which direction to go. Every step felt heavier, the woods growing denser, as if the trees themselves were closing in. Minutes felt like hours. Time stretched, warped by their growing panic. They no longer knew where they were or how long they'd been walking. Every rustle in the leaves made them flinch. Every whisper of wind made them jump. The deeper they ventured into the woods, the quieter it became. No animals, no birds, just an oppressive silence. Rachel was the first to notice it. The glow. Faint at first, barely more than a pinprick of light in the distance. It flickered, pulsed rhythmically, like a heartbeat. No, she whispered, her breath catching in her throat. Kelly saw it too, and she shook her head frantically. No, 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 we ran. We got away. How is it here? The ember, just like at the campfire. But now it was hovering in the distance, glowing a dull red, the same deep, sinister hue they had seen earlier. And just like before, it began to grow, stretching, warping, until the shadow emerged once more, towering and formless. We need to go, Rachel shouted, grabbing Kelly's arm. Now. They bolted, plunging deeper into the woods, crashing through the undergrowth in blind panic. But the ember's glow didn't fade this time. It followed them, its eerie light casting long, twisted shadows in every direction. The whispering grew louder. This time, Rachel could almost make out the words, though they slithered through her mind like smoke. Closer. Closer. Don't listen, Rachel screamed, covering her ears. But the voices were inside her head now, creeping into her thoughts, filling them with dread. Kelly gasped beside her, stumbling as her hand clutched her head. I can't. It's too loud, she whimpered, tears streaking her face. Then... In an instant, the ember flared again. This time, the shadow surged forward, faster than before, wrapping itself around Kelly's legs like tendrils of smoke. No, Rachel screamed, reaching for her, but Kelly was yanked backward, her body hitting the ground hard as the shadow dragged her toward the ember. She clawed at the earth, eyes wide in terror, her nails breaking as she tried to dig in and hold herself back. Help me, Kelly screamed, her voice raw with fear, but Rachel couldn't move. She stood frozen, paralyzed by the same terror that had claimed the others. The shadow swallowed Kelly whole, pulling her into the glowing ember. Her scream echoed through the forest and then... silence. Rachel stood there, her heart pounding in her chest, her hands trembling. Kelly was gone. The ember remained, flickering dimly, its glow weaker now, almost fading. No, Rachel whispered, stumbling backward. This... this can't be happening. But it was. She was alone now alone with the ember and whatever dark presence was tied to it. For a brief moment, the forest was still. The whispering stopped, the air felt lighter, and Rachel dared to hope, just for a second, that maybe it was over. But then the ember flared one more time. The glow, faint as it was, grew brighter again. And this time, the whisper was louder, more insistent, wrapping around her mind like a vice. Closer, come closer. Rachel turned and ran, deeper into the endless woods, with no path to guide her and no hope in sight. The ember's glow followed, flickering, waiting for its moment. Rachel ran, her feet barely touching the ground as she weaved through the dense forest. The ember's light flickered behind her, always at the edge of her vision. No matter how fast she moved, it followed, never tiring, never slowing. Her breath came in ragged gasps, her lungs burning with the cold, damp air. Her legs ached, and every part of her body screamed for her to stop. But she couldn't. Stopping meant death. No, worse than death. It meant the same fate as Mason, Dan, and Kelly. And she wasn't ready to join them. The trees thickened, their branches twisting overhead, blotting out the already meager moonlight. Rachel pushed through them, sharp twigs tearing at her clothes and skin. Blood mixed with sweat, but she didn't care. She had to keep moving. Then suddenly, the ground beneath her gave way. With a startled cry, Rachel tumbled forward, rolling down a steep slope. Rocks and dirt tore at her as she fell, landing hard at the bottom with a painful thud. For a moment, she just lay there, staring up at the sky. The ember was gone, the flickering light, the whispers, it had all disappeared. Am I free? 
Slowly, Rachel sat up, wincing at the pain in her side. She was in some kind of small ravine, the trees looming above her like sentinels. There was no sign of the ember or the shadowy figure that had taken her friends. The forest was eerily quiet once more. She tried to stand, but her legs wobbled beneath her, weak from exhaustion. She stumbled forward, catching herself on the rough bark of a nearby tree. For the first time since the nightmare had begun, she allowed herself to breathe. But something wasn't right. As she steadied herself, she realized that the ground beneath her wasn't the usual forest floor. It was smoother, more solid. Rachel looked down and gasped. Beneath the leaves and dirt, she could see faint carvings, symbols etched into the ground, barely visible in the dim light. She knelt down, brushing the debris away. The carvings were old, ancient even, and they spiraled in strange, unsettling patterns. They led toward a large, flat stone at the center of the ravine, partially buried in the earth. The symbols seemed to pulse faintly as though they were alive, drawing her toward the stone. What is this place? she whispered, her voice barely audible in the silence. Her heart raced as she moved closer to the stone, her fingers tracing the symbols. They felt warm under her touch, as though the ground itself was humming with energy. Despite every instinct telling her to run, Rachel couldn't pull herself away. Suddenly, the whispers returned. Closer. Closer. Rachel jerked her hand back, but it was too late. The symbols beneath her flared with a deep crimson light, the same light as the ember. No. No. Not again, she cried, stumbling back, but the stone was already glowing, casting a sinister red hue across the ravine. And this time it wasn't just the whispers. From the earth itself, a figure began to rise. Not the formless shadow from before, but something more solid, more real. The figure was tall, its body draped in tattered robes that seemed to blend with the night. Its face was hidden beneath a hood, but Rachel could feel its eyes on her. Cold, ancient, and filled with malice. Rachel backed away, her heart pounding in her chest. Who are you? She demanded, though her voice trembled with fear. The figure didn't answer. Instead, it raised a skeletal hand and the air around Rachel seemed to thicken, pressing in on her from all sides. She gasped, clutching at her throat as though invisible hands were choking her. The voice returned, not as a whisper, but as a booming, guttural sound that reverberated through the ravine. The heart, it beats for you. Rachel's mind raced. The heart? The ember? What did it mean? She glanced at the glowing stone, realizing now that it wasn't just any stone. It was an altar, and the carvings weren't random. They were part of a ritual, something ancient and dark. The figure moved closer, its hand still outstretched. You have come to join the others. Rachel's breath hitched. No, she screamed, stumbling back further. I'm not, I'm not part of this. But the figure only chuckled a dry, hollow sound that sent chills down her spine. You already are. You always have been. Suddenly, the ground beneath the altar cracked open, revealing a pit of fire. The glow from the ember was there, deep within the flames, pulsing like a beating heart. And just beyond the fire, Rachel could see them, Mason, Dan, and Kelly. Their faces twisted in agony, their bodies trapped in the fire, reaching out to her, their eyes pleading. No. Rachel shook her head, tears streaming down her face. This isn't real. This can't be real. The figure's laughter grew louder, more menacing. It is real. And now it's your turn. The fire surged and the shadowy figure reached for Rachel, its skeletal fingers closing in. But as they were about to touch her, something shifted. The air around her rippled and the altar's glow faltered. Rachel didn't waste a second. She turned and bolted, sprinting up the ravine as fast as her legs would carry her. Behind her, the figure let out a roar of fury, but it didn't follow. The glow from the altar dimmed, fading into the night. Rachel didn't stop running until she was far from the ravine, her body aching and her mind racing. The whispers were gone, the ember's light extinguished, for now. But as she collapsed against a tree, panting and gasping for breath, she couldn't shake the feeling that she hadn't escaped. The heart still beat. Somewhere in the depths of the forest, it was waiting for her. She wasn't free, not yet. Rachel's legs trembled as she leaned against the tree, struggling to catch her breath. Her body was drenched in cold sweat, her mind reeling from the horrifying realization that she wasn't safe, not yet. The ember, the altar, the figure, they weren't done with her. She could still feel it. The air was thick with its presence, like a living entity, watching, waiting. The forest was eerily quiet once again, 
but now that silence felt wrong. It wasn't just the absence of sound, but the sense that something was lurking just out of sight, hiding in the darkness. Her thoughts raced, trying to make sense of the nightmare unfolding around her. They're dead. All of them, she whispered, her voice cracking. Mason, Dan, Kelly, all gone, swallowed by whatever that thing was. And now it wanted her. Rachel knew she couldn't stay here. She had to move, had to get out of the woods before the ember found her again. But where could she go? Every direction seemed the same. The forest, a never-ending maze of trees and shadows. She had no phone, no map, and no way of knowing how far she'd run from the campsite. Get out. Just get out. The thought pounded in her head like a drum, urging her forward. Rachel stumbled to her feet, her legs still shaky, but she forced herself to move. She had to find a way out, had to keep going. She couldn't let it end like this. She started walking, carefully this time, staying alert to every sound, every movement in the shadows. The ember's glow was gone, but she could still feel it, an oppressive weight hanging over her like a dark cloud. She knew it was only a matter of time before it found her again. After what felt like hours of walking, Rachel spotted something through the trees. A light, faint and flickering, but unmistakably human. Her heart leaped in her chest. Could it be another group of campers, or maybe a ranger? Someone who could help? She broke into a jog, her hope surging as she pushed through the dense underbrush. As she drew closer, the light grew brighter, revealing a small clearing. At the center of the clearing was a cabin, old, weathered, but with lights glowing faintly from inside. A wave of relief washed over her. Shelter. Maybe someone was inside who could help her, or at the very least, she could hide there until morning. Rachel approached the cabin cautiously, her hand trembling as she reached for the door. It creaked loudly as it swung open, and she stepped inside. The air was musty, filled with the scent of damp wood and dust. The small room was lit by an oil lamp on the table, casting long shadows across the walls, there were no signs of anyone living there, but at least it was warm and safe for now. Rachel sank into a chair, her body finally giving in to the exhaustion. She closed her eyes, the flickering light of the lamp, a brief comfort, but her rest didn't last long. The whispers returned, closer, so close. Rachel's eyes snapped open, her heart pounding once more. The air in the cabin felt wrong, heavy. The whispers weren't outside this time, they were inside her head, louder than before, crawling through her thoughts like insects. She stood abruptly, knocking the chair over as she looked around the room. The walls were covered in strange symbols that are similar to those she had seen on the altar, etched deep into the wood. And on the table in front of her was a small stone, an ember. No, Rachel gasped, backing away from the table. It was there, in the cabin with her. The ember was glowing faintly, pulsing in time with her racing heartbeat, her eyes were drawn to the floor where more symbols were carved into the wooden planks, spiraling out from the center of the room. At the heart of the spiral, the ember sat, waiting. The door slammed shut behind her. Rachel whirled around, her hands trembling as she reached for the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. She was trapped. The whispers grew louder, and this time she could make out the words clearly. You are the last. The heart needs you. Her chest tightened, panic gripping her like a vice. She looked back at the ember on the table, its glow growing stronger. The same crimson light she had seen at the altar. It pulsed, slow and steady, like a heartbeat. Rachel's mind raced. The heart. The whispers had mentioned it before. The heart of a demon, Mason had joked. But this wasn't a joke. She understood now. The ember wasn't just a piece of burning wood. It was alive. A part of something much older. Something dark. The cabin began to creak the walls groaning as if the forest itself was pressing in. The symbols on the floor started to glow, the light spreading out from the ember, crawling up the walls like veins. Rachel backed into the corner, her eyes wide with terror as the shadows began to move, swirling around the room. The air was thick with the scent of burning wood, and the temperature plummeted, her breath coming out in frosty puffs. And then it appeared again. The figure, taller, darker, more solid than before, it emerged from the shadows, its tattered robes sweeping across the floor, the hood still hiding its face. You are the last, it rasped, the voice cold and hollow. The heart beats for you. Rachel's hands shook as she pressed herself against the wall, her body trembling with fear. I won't, I won't let you take me, she screamed, her voice cracking. The figure raised its hand and the room seemed to contract. 
the shadows pulling toward the ember in the center of the spiral. You cannot resist. You are already bound. Rachel's mind raced. The others, Mason, Dan, Kelly, they had been taken because they had stayed near the ember. They had succumbed to its call. But maybe, maybe there was a way out. Maybe the ember could be destroyed. Her eyes darted to the oil lamp on the table. Fire, fire had started all of this. Maybe it could end it too. Without thinking, Rachel lunged for the lamp, grabbing it in her shaking hands. The figure hissed, moving toward her with inhuman speed, but she was faster. She hurled the lamp at the ember. The glass shattered and flames erupted across the floor, engulfing the glowing ember and the symbols that spiraled out from it. The figure let out a deafening screech, its body writhing in the fire as the shadows were consumed by the flames. Rachel stumbled back, watching as the cabin filled with fire, the heat driving her toward the door. With a final desperate shove, she pushed the door open and ran out into the night. Behind her, the cabin burned, the light of the flames casting long shadows across the forest. The whispers were gone, the ember destroyed. For the first time since the nightmare had begun, the air felt clear. But as Rachel stood there, staring at the burning cabin, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was still wrong. The heart had been destroyed, but the ember, its glow had been too strong, too alive. Could it really be over? Rachel turned and ran, leaving the forest behind her. But in the distance, as the flames of the cabin flickered and died, a single ember remained, glowing faintly in the ashes. Rachel stumbled through the forest, her body running on pure adrenaline. Her legs felt like lead, her lungs burning with each breath, but she didn't stop. She couldn't stop. Not until she was far away from that cursed cabin, far away from the ember, but deep down she knew something wasn't right. The flames should have consumed everything. She had watched the fire rage, seen the figure consumed by the inferno. Yet the ember remained. It was still out there, flickering in the darkness, waiting for her. The forest seemed endless, the trees towering above like silent sentinels. The path, if there had ever been one, was lost to her. Every direction looked the same, a tangled mass of branches and shadows. She had no idea where she was going, just that she had to keep moving. A sudden rustling sound behind her made Rachel freeze in place. Her heart hammered in her chest, the hairs on the back of her neck standing on end. She turned slowly, her eyes scanning the darkness, but there was nothing. Just the trees swaying in the wind, their branches creaking like old bones. Her breath hitched, her throat dry. It's over, she whispered to herself, though the words felt hollow. She wanted to believe it, wanted to believe that the ember had been destroyed, that the nightmare was finally over. But the silence was too heavy, too still. Suddenly, a flash of light caught her eye, a brief red flicker deep within the trees. Her stomach dropped. The ember. It was still following her. No, she whispered, backing away. No, this can't be happening. But it was. The light pulsed again, brighter this time, cutting through the shadows like a beacon. And with it came the whispers, faint at first, but growing louder with each passing second. Closer, closer. Rachel clutched her head, squeezing her eyes shut. Go away, she screamed. Leave me alone. But the whispers only grew louder, filling her mind, wrapping around her thoughts like chains. She stumbled forward, her feet moving against her will, drawn toward the light. The ember's glow pulsed rhythmically, like a heartbeat, growing stronger, more insistent. Rachel fought against it, every step a battle, but the pull was too strong. The forest seemed to close in around her, the trees pressing tighter and tighter until she could barely move. The ground beneath her feet felt soft, almost spongy, as if the earth itself was breathing. She looked up, and there it was, the ember. Floating in the air in front of her, its deep red glow casting eerie shadows across the ground. It pulsed slowly, hypnotically, drawing her closer. The whispers in her head were deafening now, so loud she could barely think. The heart. The heart beats for you. Rachel shook her head, tears streaming down her face. No, I destroyed you. You're gone. The ember flared, its light blinding, and for a moment Rachel thought she could see something inside it. A shape, moving, writhing. A figure. The same figure she had seen before, the one that had taken her friends. And then, in a voice as cold as death, it spoke. You cannot destroy what was never truly alive. Rachel's blood ran cold. The ember wasn't just a piece of burning wood. It was something far more ancient, far more dangerous. It was the heart of the forest itself, 
the source of the whispers, the thing that had been hunting her all along. She stumbled back, her mind racing. There had to be a way out. There had to be a way to stop it. But how? The fire hadn't worked. Nothing had worked. Her eyes darted around, searching for anything she could use. The forest was silent, watching. The ember hovered in front of her, pulsing with dark energy. And then she saw it, a small clearing just beyond the trees. A break in the forest, where the ground was bare and the sky was open. Rachel didn't think. She bolted toward the clearing, her feet pounding the earth as she ran. The ember flared behind her, the whispers screaming in her mind, but she didn't stop. She couldn't stop. Not now. She burst into the clearing, gasping for breath, her heart racing. The sky above was clear, the stars twinkling faintly. For a moment, the world felt normal again. But then the ember appeared, hovering at the edge of the clearing, its glow flickering ominously. Rachel backed away, her hands trembling. What do you want from me? She shouted, her voice echoing in the stillness. The ember pulsed and the figure emerged once more, towering over her. Its hooded face was hidden, but Rachel could feel its eyes on her, cold and unfeeling. The heart must live, and you will give it life. The words sent a chill down her spine. The heart. That's what it had always been about. The ember wasn't just a remnant of a fire. It was alive, and it needed her. Rachel's breath quickened as the realization hit her. It needed to feed, needed to consume the life force of those who touched it. That's why her friends had disappeared, why they had been taken. They had been sacrifices to keep the heart alive. And now, it wanted her. No, Rachel screamed, backing away further. I won't let you take me. But the figure only moved closer, its hand outstretched. The ground beneath Rachel's feet began to crack, flames licking up from the earth. The ember pulsed with power, its light growing brighter and brighter, until it was blinding. Rachel stumbled, falling to the ground as the flames surrounded her. The heat was unbearable, the air thick with smoke. She could barely breathe, her vision blurring. The whispers were louder than ever, pounding in her skull, driving her to the brink of madness. In one last desperate attempt, Rachel grabbed a rock from the ground and hurled it at the ember. The rock struck the glowing heart, and for a moment, everything stopped. The flames flickered, the whispers fell silent, and the ember dimmed. Rachel watched, wide-eyed, as the ember's glow faded, shrinking until it was nothing more than a faint spark. For a moment, she dared to hope, but then the spark flared to life once more, brighter and more powerful than before. The figure's hand closed around Rachel, and the last thing she saw before the darkness claimed her was the ember, pulsing like a heartbeat, its light casting long, twisted shadows across the ground. In the clearing, the ember floated, glowing faintly. The whispers had stopped, the forest silent once again. But the heart still beat, waiting for the next to come, waiting for the next sacrifice. And in the ashes, the ember flickered, alive and hungry.